Last January, a 41-year-old man attacked two priests with a broken glass bottle outside Basilica di Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. While the motive was unclear at the time, police believed the man to be mentally unstable. When the assailant was apprehended by police, he dropped a small journal with a faded inscription on the back. Wildcats shall meet hyenas, goat demons shall greet each other, the two the Lilith shall repose, and find herself a resting place. Isaiah 34 verse 14 Consider the contents of this journal next time you decide to attend Mass. Looks like the Roman Catholic Church has a secret. The Lord was testing me. I sat in the office of my colleague and admired its lavish contents. There was a depiction of Christ and the Virgin Mary on the wall beside me. The halo inlaid around her head glimmered in the afternoon light. She glowed with a heavenly warmth. My eyes narrowed at the child of God in her arms. His eyes were far too old. The expression he bore was that of judgment. I felt heat rise to my cheeks. The Lord was testing me, and it wasn't fair. I proved myself years ago, but yet the Lord chose again to test me. My fingers traced the faint outline of a scratch on the desk. Things could not be ignored. Rome was beginning to talk. Incidents behind closed doors, people were saying, unholy acts under the cover of night. The congregation was always talking. My faithful flock bleeding about unsubstantiated rumors. But this time, the problem could not go ignored. If only that little brat hadn't been sneaking around. How she must have sounded, I wonder, telling the parishioners about how I stole into her mother's bedroom late one night to F her. Of course, I couldn't imagine someone believing her, much less discussing it. A priest committing sins of the flesh? Surely. I was delighted a little thinking about that night. That had been the night I asked that thing for a favor. It was obvious what had to be done. Problems like this require efficiency. My hand reached for the decanter that sat before me. It seemed my colleague had developed a little habit. I licked my lips greedily. It smelled strong like scotch, and my mouth watered in response. I kicked back the drink, and it tore through my body, winding and twisting around my ribs. I scowled as I poured more. A sudden movement from the shadows caught my attention. My eyes shot to the door. It stood closed before me, just as I had left it. Mouth agape, I waited. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. The clock on the desk ticked faithfully. It was a small and ornate device. It caught my attention while the panic subsided. I reached for the glass once again, my hand now slick with perspiration. It wasn't exactly a problem to be found where I was, in John Albani's office. This office was one of the many additions made years after the Avignon period. Albany was one of the few members permitted access to the church's arcane knowledge of the occult. Last night had been filled with complicated work. The Cardinal had approached me several weeks ago about a summoning spell. How odd, I thought at the time. Yet one day there he was, asking for my knowledge. He had a sick mother, he explained. Acute mania, a softening of the brain. There was no cure of domestic illness, the doctor had confessed. The Lord works in mysterious ways, does he not? A simple little thing, but one that required an ability to focus. One slip and before you knew it the devil had you by the balls. It had been a great success. In the end, it was Albany who proved his resourcefulness. As if one day, he awoke with the affinity for ceremonies. Some were just born lucky, I suppose. Absent-mindedly, and perhaps a little drunk, my hands ran the surface of the wood. It felt expensive and heavy. All of the brass handles were worn from use, except for one. I placed a single finger against the drawer to my right. It was the only drawer with use for a key. In that moment, I knew precisely what to do. There were only three other keys in this world that had access. I was the one that needed it the most, I reasoned. How long had it been? Months, probably, all spent wisely preparing with my readings. I could wait for Albany, like I had promised to do. Does the teacher wait for his pupil? 
I laughed to myself. The scotch settling warmly in my belly. Liquid courage, I thought tensely. My hand searched my chest, resting upon a small lump beneath my robes. I unearthed a strand of thick twine, tugging at it until finally I had pulled with it the decorative handle of a brass skeleton key. I brought it over my head and placed it on the table next to the empty glass, it still warm from my body. I didn't breathe as I closed my eyes, concentrating. The child is dead. I leapt to my feet, looking about wildly. The whisper chilled me to the bone. In my panic, I stumbled, falling back into the large leather chair behind me. Wide-eyed and panting, I scanned the dark room again. There was only the one door, still shut. I lifted myself up once again, careful to not trip this time. That scotch must have been stronger than I was prepared for. I thought about the voice that spoke and shuddered. It sounded like her. My fingers wrapped around the exquisite handle in one deliberate motion. I held the key in my hand, bringing it to the tiny opening within the drawer of the desk. As my palms sweat, the metal caught against the wood of the drawer. With a muffled click, the key was sent against mechanism. The drawer shot open against my thigh, but made no sound. I then lifted a box the size of my palm and rested it directly on the center of the desk. It was simple and undefined by any markings my eyes could see. Unlike the office, the trinket was an ugly little thing. The wood was cheap and dirty. Scorched marks encompassed the bottom. Here it was, a thing of beauty. Power, yes, now that was beauty. The Basilica di Santa Maria Maggiore was a shrine to the powers that were. It was cold, not unlike like a tomb. Yes, in fact, that was exactly what it was. A decadent and expensive tomb for old men. Albany, the poor sod, had been assigned Latin Patriarch of Antioch. The Basilica's Archpriest was just another title that meant practically nothing. How much had it cost the papacy to build this tribute to the Virgin? A palace of the popes, truly. As my fingertips brushed against the faint seam line, I felt a great surge of energy shoot through me. The box flew open, releasing a billowing cloud of black smoke. It swirled about my head. I covered my mouth with my hands, coughing loudly. Smoke grew thicker and larger until it seemed to fill the room completely. As it grew, sparks flew at me stinging my face and hands until I was forced to take shelter beneath the desk. I crouched, knowing it wouldn't last much longer. Demons in their flare for the dramatic. Why have you summoned me? Asked a voice from the front of the room. Before me stood a little girl with long dark hair and enormous eyes. She was dressed in pressed white lace. A pretty blue ribbon wrapped loosely around her waist. The hem of her dress was just long enough to show her pointed black boots. The boots caught the dim evening light from the window, and I realized they hovered just above the floor. I felt my hand instinctively reach to my pocket. From it, I withdrew a small white handkerchief. I brought it to the sweat now gathering on my upper lip. Her black gun muzzle eyes bore through me. Those eyes, glowing like the opium addicts in Boston. This form caught me off guard. She looked like that woman's daughter, the little whore. Demons always know what form to take. I command you, demon, I said, breaking the heavy silence. My handkerchief limped in my hand. You will do my bidding. Of course you do. Her voice was deep for a child her age. You must. I winced at my words. They were not chosen well, and I felt the pang of annoyance. I looked down at the box before me, its lid still closed. I lifted the lid gingerly, revealing the contents of the box. Leave it there, she snapped. She leaned toward me and took flight. The tips of her little black boots dragged against the ground, the sound muffled by expensive carpet. She reached for the box in my outstretched hand. It surprised me, but I held my ground. My eyes flashed to the box. Inside was a single white bone, the bone of a human fingertip. You can't leave the circle. I stated, leaning forward onto my desk. She paused at that. 
Last night, my colleague and I had burned a seal from the lesser key of Solomon in the floor. Hidden under the rug, it was meant to act as a prison for summoning, and it was impenetrable. I should know, I translated the reading myself. Her face had begun to split in half. Flesh parted from the center of her face on either side. There was no blood, only the pale skin stretching until it was thin enough to tear down her forehead, splitting her nose, and dividing her lips in half. Her teeth shone against the gore. Something here wasn't right. The Tartarium once acquired by the French had found its way back to the Vatican. We few had set about learning from these ancient texts. There was such wisdom to be found. There was also great power. Avignon had been a time the church suffered greatly, and so much of the knowledge had become scattered. When the popes returned, they chose this cathedral as their residence. The Lateran Palace was all but destroyed, but there was never a shortage of funds. I was only a lowly bishop at the time, and I found myself one of those precious few instructed to begin restoration. There amidst the decay we discovered a terrifying relic. My colleagues and I felt we should keep it for ourselves. We reasoned it was the only way to keep it safe. We pored over the books day and night, desperate to understand this little box and its unholy contents. She was described as Noctis Monstrum. That name didn't mean much to me, but it did to another priest by the name of Tarcisio. He explained it was an ancient power, a demon from the Old Testament. If used correctly, we transcribed, we could summon the powers of hell itself. I didn't let the opportunity go to waste. How could I? What greater irony than to bid God's work to the devil? She hissed, creating a long tear down the center of her face. Her eyes had shifted to opposite sides of her head, severing her in half grotesquely. I stepped back, unconscious of my movements. The book said, the book said, I started, clutching the edges of my desk. She was growing in size, her stomach began to bloat. What use have I for books, Cardinal, she spat, causing the tears to creep down her neck and into the ruffles of her dress. She rose in the air, skin peeling off her face and flopping to the ground below. Her neck popped and twisted, and her shoulders cracked in response. Her little body shook as I watched in horror. Pious! The thing that stood before me shrieked. I clamped down on my ears in horror. I prayed, then, but I don't know what I said. I couldn't hear myself amidst the clamor. I shut my eyes against the chaos of the room. Her brain stopped and all was still again. Oh, how I love a hypocritical display of virtue. She stood before me as a great winged beast with muscles bulging. She was covered in thick matted gray hair. It hung off her in long tendrils, some swinging with weight. On her back stood enormous leathery black wings, slick with oil. Muscles and sinews hung from the joints and tangled with her hair as she shook. Gore dragged on the ground where she stood. She huffed and snorted, pawing the ground with a glistening black talon. She had become parts of animals fused together in an ungodly creation. I recoiled in horror as it spoke. I know why you have called upon me in this hour. She said, voice booming. I fell to my knees. You must do as I command. Last time, you you did, you did my bidding, and you made her love me. My jaw slackened in awe. Kill the child before she has it. The woman you love, the woman who is pregnant with your child, she senses it. The beast said in a sing-song voice. The child. She wants to keep him. She spoke softly this time. We stood there for a moment, viscera dripping from her gaping maw. She shook her great mane, spraying grease and spit onto the paneling behind her. I nodded slowly and covered my mouth with my hand. But will they know? I asked, rubbing the small amount of scruff that had formed on my chin. I felt the demon's viscera scattered along my jaw and quickly wiped it away with the handkerchief still in my hand. The crisp white linen now bore smears of thick black grease. I dropped it in disgust. She howled with laughter. You will die long before the mother ever breathes your name to the child. I exhaled, relieved of the news I'd been told. Praise be. I whispered. 
She started to gurgle. A deep guttural sound emerged from within her throat like a groan. Was she laughing? How positively revolting. My face twisted in horror. Be gone, demon. In the name of God and all things holy. A great surge of wind traveled through the room, lifting chairs and tables from the ground. The furniture danced above my head and collided with the desk. It made a circle in the air above us. A cross fell from the wall and knocked me to the ground. Her great tail came sweeping down over me, colliding with the Bible that sat nearby. It burst into flames and fell away as embers and ash. I looked back at the beast, her massive face close to mine. The creature reeked of rotting earth. I held up my hand to shield my face, but her jaws came crashing down. I blinked in surprise and looked back to her blood-soaked mouth. A nausea grew in the pit of my stomach as I saw my three right fingers had been torn off. My ecclesiastical ring clattered on the ground in front of me. The pain tore through my arm and into my chest. She howled and shook, swinging her massive head from side to side. The pain was unlike anything I'd ever felt, and I emptied my bladder in response. I don't understand. My circle was perfect. How? I shrieked. I couldn't breathe anymore. Everything was going horribly wrong. How could this be possible? My mind screamed. God cannot abide by this. I cannot abide by this. Centuries ago, men trained their entire life to command us. What have you done but read a few old books? Relics. I will take the bastard child for myself, she screamed, her eyes rolling back into her head. He will be ripped from his mother, and on the second day of the sixteenth year, she will be made the devil's whore. I climbed to my desk, searching frantically for the little wooden box that once sat there. I turned, realizing it was nowhere to be seen. She stopped abruptly, her eyes meeting mine. The furniture that had been floating above us suddenly fell. With a great crash, I dodged the cross from hitting me once again. She lifted her talon to show the box lying on the ground before us. The demon brought her claw down and crushed it into dust. On that day your people will suffer a new god. She screeched and burst into flames, leaving behind the odor of sulfur in her wake. My god, I choked. I leapt from my place, flying to the door and out the hall into the great basilica and the raised dais of the bima. I scurried wildly until bursting out onto the porch and then through the garden. I rounded a corner, nearly colliding with the cardinal. Godfried, what has happened to your hand? He reached for me, watching as I collapsed to the ground before him. My voice wavered as I spoke. I hoped you might be out here. He had an accident. I thought I might take a moment to prepare myself while I was at my, I mean your desk, and while I was there something terrible happened. I clutched desperately at his robes. My wound left streaks of blood on the beautiful red cloth around his stomach. God fried, did it work? Were you successful? I had rather hoped we could try together, he asked, lifting me and leading me through the garden. A demon, a great powerful demon. I gestured with my hands trying to explain. His eyes followed my movements, stopping at my exposed wound. I turned to him, gripping his robes firmer than before. You've lost much blood. You need rest and bandages. When we've taken care of your injury, we'll discuss what happened. I choked out a sob and stumbled against one of the columns to my right. The circle, John, it failed. Somehow it failed. I felt I would throw up as I walked back onto the porch. He stopped and turned to me slowly, gripping my shoulders. My hands met the arms that held me steady. Please, I murmured, pale and weak from loss of blood. Surely you can. My voice trailed off, exhaustion creeping into my voice. He leaned in closely to me, whispering into my blood splattered ear. Oh, your lordship. You got the translation right, but you used the wrong seal. Imagine being present while you carved, knowing how patient I must be, waiting to taste your soul. I pulled back, terror rising in my throat. I made a choking sound as I tried to pull away from his grasp. Devil! 
I stuttered as the skin of the man's face peeled and cracked. As it split, hellfire burned underneath. Well, we can do much better, my lord cardinal, cackled the demon as its hands burned into my shoulders, driving me down into the gaping hole that was forming around my knees. My hand reached for the cross I wore around my neck and I pressed it to the creature's face. Blinded, it tore at its own flesh releasing me. I fell and began to crawl away. I picked myself up in time to avoid its grip on my robes. As I ran, I dared not look back for fear of what I would see. I hurled myself through the archways and out onto the public grounds. I don't know how I got away that afternoon. I pray it does not find me. My hand aches at the thought of it bearing down upon me. How many of us remain? How many can a demon impersonate? Tomorrow, I will return to the city and try to make contact with the Holy See. I pray to God there are others more prepared than I. God forgive me, I must try.